so our next speaker, our next speaker is Dr. Greta Wilkening. Oh, can you? Are you good at these? <laughs> She'd like to use her version, if I possible. Oh, don't worry about it. I'll just. Try if you it's can. fine. Try it's if you totally can. Totally fine. It'd be great. If you can. Yeah, give uh, it a shot. So what is it that you need? So Dr. Wilkening is a clinical neuropsychology, pediatric neuropsychology, um, so that one? and she has been in the practice of neuropsychology at Children's Hospital Denver for over 30 years. She is a professor of pediatrics at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. She trained in special education as well as neuropsychology, which makes her extra good for our kids and has consulted with schools, physicians, and families. She currently specializes in the care of children with epilepsy and brain tumors at Children's Hospital Colorado. She's been involved in several research projects, including those focused on the treatment of children with epilepsy, liver disease, and brain tumors. She's the former president of the Colorado Neuropsychology Society and the American Academy of Neuropsychology Foundation, mm -hmm. and is a former treasurer, secretary, program chair, and fellow of the National Academy of Neuropsychology. Dr. Wilkening is the devoted mom of two, now adult children, loves to cook and feed friends and family, and was once the president of her children's swim team. And I'm super <laughs> excited to hear her speak because our local epi epilepsy support group has nothing but nice things to say about their appointments with her. So, Dr. Wilkening. Thank you. I'd forgotten that I said that I used to be president of the swim team. <laughs> Um, good afternoon. You all must be completely exhausted and I suspect a little bit wrung out at this point. Um, I will try to um, go through this relatively rapidly and stop me if I say something that doesn't make any sense because um, if you don't, I grew up in New York and I will just start talking faster and faster. Um, I did try to update some errors in this talk, but um, I can't get my computer to sync or whatever it's supposed to do. So we're going to use this, and please excuse the errors. I'll try to get that fixed before they get um, posted. So what I plan to discuss today, I want to talk to you about what kind of information you can get from a neuropsychologic evaluation or you should be able to get. What ages, at what ages can that information be the most useful? I think one of the big um, issues that I deal with and I want you to be aware of is the limitations to the information that we can provide you, especially in children with epilepsy or Dravet syndrome, because they have so many contributors to the dif difficulties that we see in adaptive function. I wanna just very briefly tell you about what we know and what we don't know about neurodevelopment in children with Dravet, because I think that all of this needs to be framed in that context. And then I want you to know before you have an evaluation what you are likely, what's likely to occur. So I'm going to say at the outset that um, I'm feeling humbled. I can tell you what I know about Dravet. I can read. Um, I see your children. I see you and I hear you speak. But you live with it and I don't. And so you're the experts. And um, I will help you to understand what you're observing as best as I can but you're the ones that are observing. So first I'm gonna tell you what a neuropsychologist is. I'm gonna tell you about the bottom because that's the definition that I use. That's why it says GNW at the end of the, um, at that, at the end of that bullet. I'm a psychologist and I've received training in brain behavior relationships. We do a two year fo fellowship following a set of guidelines that are called the Houston Guidelines. Um, I'm telling you this because if you find a neuropsychologist, this is what you want to look for. And it's, um, we are professionals who are primarily focused upon the impact of brain functioning on behavior, including both, the psychosocial, including both psychosocial functioning and cognition. And we use a lot of different kinds of information and tools, including medical and psychological histories, tests, and a wide variety of tests is what I'm best at to answer questions about the role of brain-related changes upon daily function and how to optimize function. So what kind of information can a neuropsychological evaluation provide? So this is the sentence that I tried to fix, so I'll tell you what it's supposed to say. I can tell you today what group studies show, and we can talk about what group studies say about, for example, the impact of a specific medication on behavior. But frankly, you don't care much about group studies. You care about your child. And so what we want to be able to do for you is to interpret 
um, those group, group studies in the context of information that we have about a specific individual. We can talk about the level and pattern of performance and provide data to assist in the development of an IEP. Sometimes we're asked to answer questions about a response to treatment, either medical or therapeutic. And sometimes this is in the context of concerns about a regression in behavior or regression in skill. I think that it's important that we all think about um, setting priorities for intervention and that the, prior the goals that are set are not only realistic but also obtainable and that they have some importance in terms of how your, the quality of your life and the quality of your children's lives. We also can help in terms of development of um, approaches to teaching skills in, con in the context of challenges to teaching. And then finally, and not insignificantly, um, assist with longer term planning, particularly for children who are 13 and above. So when might an evaluation be useful? So I'm gonna tell you about kids in general, um, and this varies probably for um, kids in specific. We try to see kids at periods of transition. So the entrance into kindergarten is a time when we'll often see children, um, as well as entry into fourth grade because the requirements in fourth grade are so significantly different than the requirements in third grade, entrance to middle school, high school, and then finally transition to adulthood. It might also be helpful as you try to think about setting priorities for your child and for your family. Um, there are a million different therapies out there, and I think it's useful to think about what are the, um, what are the behaviors or the skills that you want to impact and how might we do that most effectively rather than trying to do everything and um, being overwhelmed and unsuccessful at everything. We talked about questions of progress or regression, long-term planning, um, and then sometimes when formally evaluating the efficacy of, of intervention. So what do we know or what do we think we know about neurodevelopment in children with um, Dravet syndrome? So we've, you've heard this 16 times today, so I'm going to say it very quickly. But um, development is typically thought of as normal prior to the onset of seizures. There's some evidence that there may be some visual spatial or proce visual processing difficulties prior to that point. We think there are characteristic phases to the neurodevelopmental pattern with early development being um, normal, with the developmental tra trajectory slowing during the period between three to six years of age, and with subsequent declines relative to the same age peers, but the, with the rapidity of the decline fading. Um, in terms of level of performance, we think that there's variability in the cognitive and behavioral phenotypes reported. And the different um, studies suggest that there's a range of functioning from normal cognition to severe intellectual impairment. And part of the difficulty is that the, the population is quite heterogeneous. Um, and there is some suggestion that the presence or absence of the mutation makes in different populations um, creates even greater heterogeneity as well as the frequency of seizures, et cetera, which makes interpretation of the group data kind of difficult and is why I say what I did, which is you don't really care about the group data, you really care about your child. I think the important thing to remember is that we don't think that there is typically a regression in skills. We do think that there is a change in the rate of acquisition of skills. And so although the developmental vector changes, this typically isn't a loss. Just to sort of um, make it visible for you, you can see that if you measure, if you assess the same child longitudinally, you tend to see a decrement, and then it levels out a little bit. And this is a 2011 study. And another 2011 study shows essentially the same pattern with a decline in skill followed by leveling out, or a decline in skill relative to same age peers before leveling out. Um, there have been any number of studies that have looked about at the range of performance. Um, you'll see that these are actually fairly small studies by and large with the exception of this 2013 study but they all demonstrate essentially the same thing, that when you um, are evaluating large groups of children with 
with um, Dravet syndrome, they tend as a group to present with moderate levels of intellectual disability. Um, and I guess the only other point that I would make is that when you look at long-term follow-up, um, one of the things that we need to be thinking about is the um, ability to live independently in the future, which is relatively limited based on the data that we have. So what else do we think we know? We think that um, there is a pattern, which I, one of the, which most of us would describe as a phenotype in terms of cognitive um, functioning, and that is that visual, motor, and spatial skills are more impaired than language skills, and that receptive language skills are more preserved than expressive skills. The difficulties that we um, describe in terms of attention, um, the inhibition of a perseverative response, impulsivity, all come under the headings of disorder, disorders of executive function, and this is something that is seen fairly ubiquitously um, among the studies. And then there is inconsistent evidence about the relationship between the presence of the SCN1A mutation and um, outcome, with many studies suggesting that um, outcome is poorer in children who have this, um, this mutation. There's also, and again, this, every, everybody else has talked about this today, so I'm not going to belabor it, but the relationship between the seizures per se and the cognitive phenotype is unclear. Um, it, there's some suggestion that those who don't have early myoclonic or atypical absence seizures have better development. There's some people who think that the presence of convulsive or prolonged seizures um, don't have prognostic value. Others dis disagree with that. And some authors suggest better long-term term developmental outcome in the children who have been more recently um, diagnosed. And, Kelly um, Knopp alluded to that this morning, and she alluded it to it in the context of the rapidity with which children the, now are treated. There's some others who suggest that it has to do with the fact that the medications are more effective with the new generation of anticonvulsants, and that therefore children are doing better. And so one of the issues that we have in interpreting all this data is that we see cohorts. And so a cohort who is diagnosed 10 to 12 years ago is a different cohort than children who are being diagnosed currently. And so although we can talk about outcome data in specific cohorts, um, you need to keep in mind that it is that cohort and that the outcome may be different. So um, I'm going to just briefly talk about the executive function difficulties that we talk about or that we read described and we hear about in the clinic disturbances in attention and level of activity, as well as increased irritability, aggressiveness, and opposition are frequently reported. And um, there's some suggestion that these are more prevalent and more common early in the course of the disease, and that as um, children go through um, development, that they um, disappear or at least become more quiescent. Um, in the adult population, 25% were reported, of the adults were reported to have very significant um, psychiatric or behavioral difficulties. But again, we don't know if this is a cohort effect and if the outcome will be better in children who have been treated earlier and more effectively. Um, there's been once, you, you all know that autism or um, um, spectrum-like behaviors are pretty common in children with, um, with Dravet syndrome. And there's some suggestion that this is a specific component of the phenotype because those with um, Lennox Glisteau don't have um, as many um, children who have this particular pattern of behavior. And there's also the suggestion that the internalizing difficulties, depression, um, and withdrawal are more common in those who are doing well or doing better um, in terms of intellectual and cognitive performance. Um, the behavioral and the um, intrusive behaviors are more common and more problematic in children who have poor development. So that was not a terribly uplifting component, but it's the basis from which we work. Um, I want to tell you what happens when I do a neuropsychologic evaluation, and not all of us work exactly the same way. We're fortunate here to be able to see um, 
primarily um, children who come to us from internally, um, internally from the hospital. So almost everybody that I see has some sort of neurologic diagnosis. We also have some peculiarities because we live in Colorado, and that is that many of our patients come from very far away, and so we try to um, get as much done as we can in a single shot as possible. Those of you who live in higher um, density population states, um, the neuropsychologists that you work with are likely to operate in a slightly different fashion. So typically when we see patients, we will take a history, we'll do specific assessment, including observation and testing, we'll review the data, and we'll conference with you to, um, to review the results of the assessment. So why do we do a history? The big portion of the history for me is finding out why the family is there. And sometimes they're there because somebody told them to show up. <laughs> and sometimes they're there because they have a specific question that they want answered. And so um, I would encourage you before you go to an evaluation to think about what it is that you want to get from that particular session. Sometimes there are very specific questions that the referrer is asking of us. So if, for example, um, there's a new medication that's being used and there are concerns about changes in attention or um, alertness, if we have an older evaluation, we might want to go back and, and compare a new evaluation to the old evaluation. We also take a, a medical history in terms of what's gone on and what the, um, the course of the disease has been, the developmental, educational, and therapeutic history, a social history, and a behavioral history. What I tell my um, trainees is that when I am finished taking history, I want to be able to tell you what I think is going to happen when you go into a certain situation. And I'm not going to be right, probably, but I want to at least be in the ballpark. So I want to be able to say, one of my common questions is, do you go to the supermarket? Will you go to Target Boutique with X, Y, and Z child? And I want to be able to predict in my, set, in my head internally whether it's likely that that's something that the family can take on or whether they have been experiencing enough challenges that it's not something that they're willing to do. Because that allows me to feel confident that I can help the family to, um, to plan and to understand the behaviors. So you have a really important role if you take your child for an evaluation. That is the more information you can give us the better off we're going to be. So if there have been IEPs or prior, prior assessments, those are terribly helpful. And then we're probably going to ask you to complete surveys to tell us about what you're observing and what your concerns are. I think that it's horribly important that we observe your child's behavior. Sometimes parents apologize for what we're observing. But actually, it's much easier for me if I see what you see. Um, but I also want to. Um, ask the child about their experience. And so I'm almost always will ask a child about their friends. I'll ask them about what they're reading, if they're reading, about the school they attend, about what they like about it, what they don't like about it. I almost always get my patients back from the waiting room at some point during the day, and I want to know if they can find their way back, and can they find their way in and out of our tiny little suite. Um, because that's telling me something about their ability to make sense of what they're observing and to integrate their experience into planning for the next step. I see them often after, throughout the day, and so it's helpful to know, can they tell me what they ate for lunch? Can they tell me where they went? Because so many of our patients come to us um, from out of state, do they know where they're staying in Denver? And what did they do last night? They've almost always um, done something at the swimming pool. <laughs> um, I want to know if they respond to my shaking their hand when I greet them, and if they have that social awareness of um, what's required. And I also want to know how they do specific tasks. And then I have the tests, and I have the scores from the tests. So the kinds of things that we, tend, we typically assess in a comprehensive evaluation is a measure R, a measure of um, overall functioning. We look at language skills, both um, receptive and expressive skills. I'm now um, five minutes over, so I will try to go through this quickly. If you are um, listening out, I would not be offended. You've been here a long day. Um, 
but I want you to know that I'm aware of this, okay? Um, we will look at visual perception and visual problem solving, academics, sensory and motor functioning, memory, and then tasks of executive functions, as well as behavior and functional adaptive skills. I'm going to show you some pictures. Um, they're not particularly helpful, but we use standard measures of overall skills and abilities. It's an IQ measure. This is a standard test. It's called the WISC. Um, the question here, can you see this? I don't know. Yeah, you can. The question here is, can you show me three pieces that will go together to, to make this? You may have to rotate it in space. Over here, the question is, can you find um, all the things that are things that you use to play ball, I believe is that one. And over here, you're trying to put the blocks together to copy a pattern, and we look at all of those skills. We look at motor dexterity. This is the groove pegboard test. This is the wide range assessment of visual motor, visual motor abilities. Um, and it's, a, again, a pegboard. Um, we, we're, so we're looking at dexterity. We look at language, including receptive language, and then expressive language. Can you tell me what these things are? We look at visual, uh, visual motor skills, copying specific figures, being able to find these smaller figures in this mess here, understanding what you're looking at when it's not presented in a clear fashion, and then understanding that there's a pattern here and predicting which is the next piece in that pattern. Nobody gets all these measures, by the way. <laughs> we try to look at memory. Memory can include remembering what you see and remembering what you hear. In terms of remembering what you see, can you recreate this pattern um, once you've seen it um, using tiles? Um, can you remember which of these? You can't tell that they're in boxes, but they're in boxes. Can you remember which of these dots I pointed to? And can you remember this list of words? We are interested in academics, if the child is in an academic program. Um, and I think that part of this has, we look at reading, spelling, and arithmetic. We don't do tremendous amount of academic testing. But you can get an understanding of what the child's um, having difficulty with and not having difficulty with by looking at the way that they um, answer problems. So a child who spells, um, mother um, without an R at the end um, is telling you something about the sequence of uh, telling you something about what they hear and how well they understand what they're doing um, as they try to symbolize sounds. And finally, we look at executive function. Some of you have seen this. It shows up in a lot of party stores. Um, so you're, the, the child, if they're reading, is, and they have to be relatively good readers, is asked to read the, first they just see the color names in um, black. And first they see the colors themselves. Then they see the color names in black. And then they see the color names, but the color names are written in opposing colors. So they're asked to tell us the name of the color. So this is red, and this is purple. I think it's purple. This is green, and etc. It's actually a really hard task. Um, we do some sorting tasks. This card could match here if we're talking about matching by color, but it could match here if we're talking about number, and we could match it here if we're talking about shape. And if you put it down on the color, matching on color, and if I tell you you're wrong, can you figure out another strategy? So is there, do you have ways of thinking about how you solve problems, or do you get stuck on one way of thinking about it? This would be another measure of the same thing. So if I asked you to ask me yes or no questions and to try to figure out what are the, which of the items I'm thinking about, you could ask me if it's um, a fruit. Um, that's a good question because it's a high level question, but it's not the best question because you only get rid of two of the items. If you asked me, is it a vehicle, and I said no, then you'd have gotten rid of four of the items, right? And so we want to know how, this is really not the test. I made this up. <laughs> but um, the test has other items. But the point is there are various ways of coming at this information. So we typically give feedback to families. The feedback should answer the specific question that was asked as far as I'm concerned. And sometimes this, whether our capacity to do so is dependent upon the question that we've been posed. So, why is this so complicated? I have all these tests. I just pull them out, and I figure out what I can do. And you know why it's complicated. 
The, ki our, the kids that we see have seizures before they come to assessment. They have been started on a new medication and they're not feeling their best. They have behavioral discontrol or poor cooperation. But I think the biggest issue for me and the thing that I try the hardest to um, transcend is that these are pretty high level tasks. And often the tasks are not immediately understood by the kids. And so we need to figure out what it is that they're why they're failing, or why, if they're failing, why they're failing. So I don't want to just know that they can't do it. I want to know what is it that they can't do. And I can't figure that out unless I can find a task that they can understand, they under, that I am clear that they understand the purpose of the task, and that they understand what the goal is. So a child who looks at that figure and says, you pick up, you use this one, this one, and this one, and who really hasn't looked at the, do you remember that? I told you they needed to find the three that, that, need, that made up the bigger one. Do you remember that one? Okay, good. <laughs> um, if, they, if they're not able to understand that it has to be three, that they, and that they, they can rotate them in their head, and that they can't go on top of each other, I don't, all I know is that they're guessing. I don't know anything about their ability to solve the problem. So the biggest challenge in terms of assessing children, for me, in terms of addressing, assessing children with um, Dravet is often making sure that I'm doing a task that has some meaning and that they understand the purpose of. The other issue is persistent, independent persistence. So I can teach a child a task and I can help them through it step by step. But what I want to know, or what I need to know in part, is can they do that by themselves? Because that's what, in the world, we're looking for. Can you go step by step independently and go um, a, from task to task? And so the inability to persist sometimes limits our, our capacity to give you the information you want. And then finally, we tend to use standardized tests, which preclude our ability to teach. They can preclude our ability to teach um, in addition to the instructions that we give and to modify the tasks. So one of the things you will want to ask is, you know, are these scores based on standardized administration, or is this something different? And sometimes qualitative assessment is all that's possible. And it can be equally valuable, but you need to understand that's what, you'd, um, what you're seeing. So what else should you expect? You should expect to get a copy of the report to give to the school if that's needed. You should expect suggestions regarding how to approach school if that was the focus. You should expect a consideration of the next steps. And um, I try to be thoughtful about when the next time it would be helpful to see a child will be so that we can make good um, recommendations and can provide useful information to you. So that was pretty quick. Um, there's lots of work. Um, dream big, work hard, and stay humble. Um, I'm happy to take any um, questions that you have. I hope that's a helpful um, overview of what it is that we do on a daily basis. And um, you all know how to find me. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I think you just answered this, but so my son is nonverbal and has really, really low receptive language skills. So his struggle with these tests is understanding what to do. Yep. So it, is there a way to, have you figured out a way to, test for cognition without receptive language skills? So there are a number of measures. There are a number of measures that are nonverbal in nature and allow for demonstrations, in fact, mandate demonstrations rather than verbal instructions. The one that most people are aware of is called the LIDER, um, the LIDER International Performance Scale. I think, however, that there are, there's a separate issue, which is you can not understand the words, but sometimes it's hard just to understand what the point is, that you need to match or that you need to find, tell, show us the next one in the sequence. That's pretty darn hard to do if you can't teach what it is you 
if you can't teach what the goal is. Does that make sense? So yes, there are different tests that you can do that are nonverbal in nature. But if the child doesn't understand it, then is that a limitation of the test? Like you can't really clearly understand his cognitive level because he can't understand the instructions? I think there would be a lot of equivocation about that. Um, there's a lot of suggestion that, um, that language is sort of inherent in intellectual capacity. Um, some people would probably tell you that it shouldn't be interpreted. I would tell you that it probably should, that what we want to know is how a child is doing functionally and that um, if we, with good effort and lots of demonstration um, and modeling, really can't teach how to do the, a task that we've learned something about the child, yeah. Hi, um, is there a certain age that you wait for a child to be before you actually give them an IQ score? So we more and more don't use the term IQ. Um, so um, different measures have different scores. So the, the infant tests do, are very clearly not, well, A, they're not very predictive, um, but very clearly don't use that term. By time we get to three, four-ish, we start calculating, we, or can calculate an IQ. Now, how predictive it is, you could quibble about, um, but um, we can calculate it. How different are your testing from birth to two, two to six, <laughs> six to eight? I think pretty different. <laughs> so <laughs> the measures that I showed you are um, typical, the things that I showed you were really school-aged kinds of tests. So um, when we're talking about, I'm not even going to go below two and a half, three. Okay. Um, but when you start at three, the measures are, they have the same names, but they don't test the same things. So there's a vocabulary section in the preschool measure, but it's a very different task than the vocabulary section in the school age measure. There's um, a measure of, um, what, what was a good one? Um, Nonverbal reasoning um, in, the, in the preschool measure. And it looks like the one in the, in the school age measure, but it's really more of a matching task. And so I, I, my feeling is that in young children, we're typically measuring much more how well are they developing, unless there are clear areas of strength and weakness. And then when we get to the older children, we can look at patterns of performance more effectively. Does that make, does that answer you? Yeah, question? that makes sense. Um, I was just listening to the young lady that talked about the nonverbal. Yeah. I'm thinking if she, he's nonverbal and how much is he comprehending what we're saying? Yeah. And it was his test, and I have no idea how young, how old his, her, her child is, but if you have a nonverbal at the age of six and yet and you could have a verbal at the age of two, they could actually test about the using the same testing. So sometimes that's what we do. Okay. So that's sometimes what, what I'll do is if I can't get the right measure for a kid, we'll test them using a younger child's version and convert it into a an age equivalent. There are statistical problems with age equivalents. Um, but at least it gets us into the ballpark in terms of figuring out what would be a good um, place to start in school and what are appropriate goals. So yeah, um, you know, <laughs> if you test enough kids, you get a lot of tricks. <laughs> I, I, I realize that. <laughs> yeah. Just, uh, yeah, no, that's that's a good yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, <laughs> but that was a good that's a good strategy. So you do it backwards. Okay. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, so we first saw a neuro neuropsychologist because we were seeking ABA therapy, and to get ABA therapy, we had to have a diagnosis, diagnosis of autism. Correct, correct, and could be and mainly because we really wanted to focus on um, expressive and receptive mm -hmm. language mm -hmm. capability. But go, so my our daughter is seven years old, 
but should we be seeking reevaluations for other purposes? I mean, I'm just thinking about, I, we, we experienced resistance in the public school system. They did not want to accept our private diagnostic reports. They wanted only to rely on their internal. But I'm not certain that that's appropriate, but I'm just trying to uh, think for the future. So I, um, I gave you the times when I thought reevaluation might be appropriate. Um, I think, so the way I think about it is this. Um, we know that kids solve problems differently at different times. So I'm going to give you an example. So if you show a preschooler two um, glasses, one is tall and narrow, and the other is wide and low. And you give them two cups of water, and you say, you know, and you pour them in. So you've shown it to them. And you sh pour these cups of water. They have the same amount. And you pour them into these cups. Um, and you say to them, which of these jars or which of these glasses has more water? When kids are less than seven or eight, they will tell you inevitably that it's the tall, thin one that has more water. They are very stimulus bound and they can't think about transformations. So if you take the water in those things, you pour it back in the, the measuring cups, they're the same again, right? But they can't do that internally. So part of the trick, I think, is that um, the kinds of questions that kids can answer, that we expect them to answer, vary at different times. And so Yes, I would recommend a reevaluation at times because what you want to know is can has that next developmental step in terms of the way that we think about problems shifted over time. I am sorry that your school district um, gave you a hard time. I think I, I was thinking about it this morning because I knew that question would come up. And I was trying to think how many times I've had issues. <laughs> there the the good news is that if you see a lot of kids, and I know it's your kid, not everyone else's kid, but um, it, thank goodness it happens fairly rarely, so don't give it up. I was, I was really going through my mind, and I've been doing this for 30 plus years. I think there are maybe five or six times when I've had a knockdown drag out. Um, the most recently with a kid, with, a, with, with someone, I hope this will make you laugh, it makes me laugh. Um, it was it's a school psychologist who's parents I knew before he was born, and I had made him a teddy bear when he was born. And when he, when he wouldn't listen to me, I was really pissed off. <laughs> that one I won. <laughs> Anything else I can help you with? I'll hang out for a few minutes, and if you have some questions, come on up. Okay? Good luck. Thank you. You're most welcome.